All right, welcome back. So today we're gonna implement an enemy health system and I'm gonna do it differently than you've probably seen other people do in the past. We're gonna be doing our enemy health using scriptable objects so that we have a much more flexible enemy health system. So let's dive right in and get started. All right, so where we left off last time, we have our enemy, I'll chase our player. We're able to inflict some knockback on the enemy. The enemy's able to inflict some knockback on us, but we don't have a health system set up yet. So I'm gonna set up a health system today differently than you've probably seen in other videos. I'm gonna use a built-in Unity system called Scriptable Objects. And I'm gonna be using that not only for the health system, but we're gonna be creating a kind of rudimentary signal system that we're going to use so that we don't have to have rigid connections so that what we built here can be easily taken from this project to another project without too much hustle or bother. So scriptable objects for enemy health today. Let's dive right in. Uh, the first thing I want to do is I want to go into my scripts folder and I want to create a new folder inside there. And I'm going to call this uh, scriptable objects. And then inside this folder, I'm gonna make a new C sharp script. And I'm gonna call this float value. Now a lot of what I'm doing is inspired by two Unity talks. Um, one is from David Fine, and then I can't remember the other guy's name. He's the lead architect at Shell Games. Uh, I'll include links to both talks in the description. If you are interested in working on larger projects that might have more complex architecture, I cannot advise you enough to watch those two videos. They're both really, really good. They're both really good speakers, and they help a lot. So uh, let's open up this float value script here. Now, this is going to be a script that isn't a mono behavior. So we're going to take away inheriting from mono behavior. And instead, we're going to inherit it from a scriptable object, which means that this script cannot be attached to anything in the scene, which is actually good. We want it to live outside the scene. And then by living outside the scene, we can assign um, values to it that can be read through multiple scenes. So because this doesn't exist in any one scene, it doesn't get a start or an update tick uh, or on, no, I think it gets on enable and on disable, but it doesn't get start or update, which means that uh, it doesn't get reset when you reload the scene. So you can have this be values outside of your scene, and then when you stop your scene, you don't have to reset any changes you made, which can be both good and bad. Um, so to make this a scriptable object that we can actually use, we're gonna add uh, in square braces up above the class something called create asset menu, which allows us to create this as an object using a right click. So I'm gonna get rid of the start and the update method because this doesn't receive those. And I'm gonna go super, super simple with this. I'm just gonna do public float, oop, whoa, not what I wanted. Uh, public float initial, initial value. All right, cool. So I'm gonna save this and that's, that's it for the scriptable object itself. Now, if I go back into Unity, uh, I'm gonna go to my assets. I'm gonna create a new folder under assets for scriptable objects. So I'm moving a bit too fast for Unity here, especially if my laptop's recording too. So scriptable objects. I'm gonna open up this folder I'm gonna right click, and when I go to create now, you'll see that now I can make a float value. I'm gonna call this float value, um, we'll call it to hit enemy health. Because this is gonna be the health I'm gonna use for every enemy that should take two hits. So for now, I'm gonna set that value to two. Now, I'm gonna go back to my log here, and actually, before I go to my log, I'm gonna to go to my uh, to do, do, do my scripts, and I'm going to grab my enemy script, the one that the log is inheriting from. Now, remember that this holds everything that I would want every enemy to have. So there's a state machine, there's a current state, um, I already included a health. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to create another value here. This is going to be a public float, and this is going to be called max health. 
And instead of it being a float though, I'm gonna have it be a float value. And I'll save this. And now by doing that, oh, one more thing too. In my start method, I'm gonna say, so private void start. I'm gonna say that my health, and it would help if I could spell it correctly, is equal to max health dot initial value, which is gonna grab that value from the float value. And I wanna convert it to an integer. So actually, I'll just make this a float instead, just in case I wanna have like 0.5 or something. There we go. So I'll save that. I'll go back into Unity here. And now, because the log script inherits from the enemy script, that float value is going to automatically appear as part of Larry the log as soon as Unity catches up to me. So I've got my max health here. I can go to my scriptable objects, grab my two hit enemy, and pull that in. Now, if I make changes to the two hit enemy, every two hit enemy that I make is going to have the same change automatically applied to them, which is an argument for why you might want to do it this way. It seems convoluted, I know, especially if you've seen other people do this differently. However, if you're going to have a, more than one enemy in your scene that's going to take two hits, instead of having the prefabs each have their own health script that has its own value that you set, if you say you want all of your two-hit enemies to suddenly become one-hit enemies, all you have to change now is this one object and not 15, one for every two-hit enemy, if that makes sense. So, all right, cool. Now, um, his health here is two. Um, if I hit start, oh yeah, it's still going to be two though because... Duh. Um, I'm setting it to be equal to that. So let's say that I want my two hit enemies to all of a sudden have a health of one. If I now go to Larry the Log and hit play, you'll see that the health is going to change to one. Hmm. Did not. Why did it not change? I wonder if I didn't change my initial value here. No, I did. Why did it not change? Oh, because the public values override. Okay. In Unity, public values override. So I'm actually going to, instead of making this a public float, I'm going to make it private so it's not exposed. Save this, and then... Um, I'll just use debug to show you that it works. In Unity, if you make something public and you set it in the inspector, it automatically overwrites anything else, even if you're setting that in the start method. The only time it wouldn't overwrite it is if you're setting it in the update method. And I don't want to have this be an update call, so I'm just going to go to debug. Um, so I can see the health here. Now if I hit play, my health is going to change to be whatever the two-hit enemy health is which is zero for some reason. What the heck? This worked a second ago. Private float health. Health is equal to max health dot initial value. Sorry about that weird cut. Um, this is actually later on in the day. So the whole problem I was having with my health here is because I'm kind of an idiot sometimes. Uh, I had forgotten that I'm using the start function in log, and log is inheriting, is inheriting from enemy, which means that the start function is overwriting the previous function. So rather than doing uh, setting the health or making it private, I can still make it public. Um, rather than setting the health in the start method in the enemy class, I'm going to set it in the awake method. So we're going to do not public, private void, awake. And then in here, we're going to say our uh, health is equal to max health dot initial value. And then if I save this, if I go back into Unity here and take a look at my log, and I'll let that catch up to where I am, and then hit play, I'll be able to see the, the health change to what I want it to be. So if I hit play, uh, it's going to think for a second. And there we go. My health is one. 
I'm going to go back to my scriptable objects and make this a two hit enemy. So it's going to take two. Uh, now, what I want to do is take a look at a few different things. First, I want to go into the knockback script and I'm going to overload my call to knock in the enemy class. I'm also going to create a new variable for anything that gives knockback. It should also be giving damage. So I'm going to call a public float damage. And if it's something that you want just to knock the player back and not give any damage, like the, um, the jellies in Zelda, um, you can just give it a damage of zero. And I'm going to pass that through into the enemy. And there's one thing I want to make sure that I'm doing because it causes an issue sometimes but not other times, and I'll come back to that. It has to do with this um, when we're creating the knockback. So uh, other dot get component enemy dot knock hit knock time. I'm going to pass in a third argument damage, and right away that's going to give me an error. But I'm going to fix that error in just a second. I'm going to go to my enemy here, and I'm going to say that knock is also going to take in a float of damage, and it's also going to pass that damage on to the coroutine. And the coroutine is also going to take in a float of damage. Um, actually, I guess I don't need to do this in the coroutine. I can do this separately and then leave this, that, and then I'll deal with that damage in just a second. Right now it's blacked out because I'm not using it. So I'm going to create another quick little method here inside the enemy. I'm going to call this a Actually, this can be private, void, take damage, and it's going to take in a float value for the amount of damage to take. And then all I'm going to do for this is health minus equals damage, and then I'll check to see if health is less than or equal to zero, because you might end up giving it more damage than it has health. Then we're going to do this dot game object. Actually, do, do, do. Yeah, let's do this dot game object dot set active false, just in case we want to do something with um, uh, not necessarily a pooling system, but something that's a little less intensive on the system. Calling a destroy method here is going to um, cause a, a call to the garbage collector, which maybe we want to minimize that. So in our knock method, in addition to starting the coroutine, we're also going to call the take damage. So we're going to do take damage, and we're going to pass in damage. Now, for the most part, this should be fine. Um, I'm going to save my scripts. I'm going to go back into Unity here, and I'm going to find my player's um, hitboxes that we're using to hit the, the enemy as soon as this is done compiling. And I'm going to give them an amount of damage to start with. So for now, they're going to start with 1 as their damage. If I hit play here, remembering that this enemy is supposed to be able to take 2 hits before, they, uh, before they're done, so right now their health is 2, if I move up to them, so that was fine, um, but the coroutine wasn't started because the game object log was inactive. So let's fix that. So we're only going to start the coroutine. Oh, OK. That's actually part of the issue I was expecting. So even though we hit it twice, we would expect the knockback to not necessarily cause that much of an issue. What we want to do here is go back to our knockback script. And we only want to call um, the, we only want to change the current state and then call the knock method if we're hitting the trigger. Because if you remember, we have two different colliders on our enemy. Now one solution to this, and this would probably have been a better way to do this, is to have the two different colliders on sub-objects of the enemy. So like I could have a, a game object that is a child of the log that has the collision on it, and I could call that collision. And then that one wouldn't be tagged enemy but I could have another child that is tagged enemy that would act as the hurt box. Thinking about it now, you know, eight weeks after I started this, that would be a better way to do it because then we're enforcing these kind of um, object-oriented principles, which I'm not doing right now, but 
uh, for now it's fine. It, I just need to realize that there's two different colliders on this object. And when I'm looking for entering the collider, one of them, could, like I could have that trigger twice because I have two different colliders that could enter at the same time. So I want to say not only is other dot compare tag enemy, I also want to say other dot is trigger. So I only want it to register if it's hitting the trigger, not if it's hitting the collision um, collider. So I'm going to save that really quickly here. Let's go back into Unity. Let's hit play. And let's try this out. So, do, 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 do. Uh, okay, cool. So, and there we go. Two hits, the enemy's gone. It didn't try and start a coroutine that it couldn't finish. So, we're good. Um, yeah. So now, the whole reason of doing it this way, like I said, is you might end up having a whole bunch of enemies that you want to take two hits. And rather than having to change the health on every single prefab, if you just have the prefab reference a two hit health, then you can just change the two hit health when you want it to um, have a different amount of damage that it would take. Now, we can do all kinds of stuff with this float value. For example, I set the damage here. Instead, I can have a player damage scriptable object that this is referencing instead of uh, rigidly assigning the amount of damage there. That would also be much more efficient and it would be a much more flexible because then I might have a power up later down the road that I want the player to do double damage, like if it's a golden sword or something like that. And then having it change to the golden sword would just mean changing the scriptable object, not changing each of the four hitboxes. So, yeah. Um, next time we're going to talk about how we can set up a rudimentary signal system in Unity to, again, avoid even more of these rigid connections between game objects so that our objects themselves are much more flexible and much more easy to port other, over to other systems. So uh, I'll include the link to those two talks in the description down below. One of them, like I said, is from Richard Fine. The other one, I cannot remember the, the guy's name off the top of my head but he's the lead architect at Shell Games. So you can watch those two. They're both really, really good talks, especially if you're planning on doing anything with Unity or any larger projects that might need some, some architecture. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the description down below. You can follow me on Twitter to find out when I post new videos. You can uh, join my Discord, where I'm chatting pretty much every day. And yeah, uh, I hope you guys have yourselves a wonderful day.